Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Friends of the Dar, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Last month, Dar al-Atar Islamiyah was delighted to receive a lecture from Dr. Ziad Salamin, who dealt with the rock-hone rose city of Petra, the most visited tourist attraction in Jordan and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Actually, this looks familiar. It looks like the, the same picture we saw last month. This month, the Dar welcomes another scholar devoted to the fascinating study of Nabataean history. Tonight's speaker, Dr. Leila Naama, is a senior research fellow at the National Center for Scientific Research in Paris. Like Dr. Salamin, she is involved in the archaeology and epigraphy of Nabataean culture. And she, is also, she also has specialized in the development of the Nabataean script into Arabic. Dr. Leila is the director of the, uh, the, the Medain Saleh Archaeological Project, which leads to this evening's discussion entitled The Nabataean and Roman City of Hegra, Medain Saleh, the ongoing excavation and surveys. Dr. Leila will be contributing to our understanding of this important period through archaeological evidence. While there is no evidence, to the best of my knowledge, of mobile phones being used in the Nabataean or the Romans, they have been found from time to time in the possessions of our audience. So be kind to turn them off and let's welcome Dr. Leila Nama. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction, and uh, thank you very much to, for your invitation to come and present a lecture here. I'm very happy and proud and honored to do it, and it was also my it is also my first visit to Kuwait, and um, I hope I will be able, if you like my lecture enough, uh, to come back another time because I haven't had enough time to see everything all that I wanted to see. So I hope it is just the beginning of a possible further uh, collaboration, cooperation, uh, friendship with the people I will uh, meet here. So thank you very much. And I have decided to read my paper. I thought I would do it as a slide, but it will be a mixture because when one does it on the slides only, you get drowned into uh, things which you would not have wanted to say. So. Medan Saleh in northwest Arabia is one of the major Nabataean sites in the Arabian Peninsula and the first to have been inscribed in 2008 on the UNESCO World Heritage List. And so it is the 10th anniversary of the inscription on the, of the site on the World Heritage, on the UNESCO World Heritage List. It is also probably the second most important one after the Nabataean capital. Petra, and so I come back to this map, presently in southern Jordan, Medan Saleh corresponds to ancient Hegra. Hegra in the Nabataean inscriptions, Egra and Hegra in Greek and Latin respectively, and of course, El Hajr in Arabic, which is the title of a well-known Quranic surah, Surat El Hajr, which you all know. And I would just like to make a small comment on these two names, because uh, maybe some of you do not know that al hajr with the al tarif at the beginning of the word, of the toponym, is the exact equivalent of hajra, because in Aramaic, the long a at the end of the word is actually al tarif It's the determinative. So al hajr equals hajra. And so that is why the Nabataean name is uh, where is it? It's Hijra in Nabataean, and it is Al Hajr in Arabic, but it's exactly the same thing. And Hegra, Hijra 
gave this in Greek and this in Latin. So it's all very logical. The name Medain Saleh was given to the site much more recently, since it appears for the first time in Ottoman sources from the 17th century, more precisely in a geographical textbook known as Jihan Numa. The name Medain Saleh refers to the pre-Islamic prophet Saleh, who unsuccessfully tried to convert the inhabitants of the settlements there, called the Thamud, hence Madain, the cities of Saleh, to the worship of a unique god. Medain Saleh is the name under which the site is presently most widely known. And I will just comment briefly this uh, nice uh, landscape, which is uh, a place which is called Mabrak al Naga, which is about 10 kilometers north of Medain Saleh. And according to the tradition, this place is known to be the passage um, with, at which the Naga, the she camel, which was sent by the Prophet Saleh to, as a proof of his prophecy, to try to convert the Samud to the the worship of a unique god was killed. So the Samud refused to believe in the unique god and, called, and killed the she camel sent by the prophet in supposedly, the tradition puts it here, this Mabrak and Naga. So it is a beautiful place with very many inscriptions along the walls. The surveys and excavations at Medain Saleh undertaken since 2002 uh, by the Saudi French Medain Saleh archaeological project placed under the aegis of the French Ministry for Foreign Affairs and the Saudi Commission for Tourism and National Heritage, have shown that the main human occupation at the site extends from roughly the first millennium BC, the mid-first millennium BC, to the mid-first millennium CE. That is, for about one millennium, as you can see on this chronological frieze. Before the mid-first millennium BC, we know of a late Bronze Age tumulus dated to the end of the third, early second millennium, you have the date in red on top, excavated in the western part of the city by a brilliant young archaeologist, Wael Abu Azizi, while after the mid-first millennium CE, we know of early Arabic inscriptions mainly in the area of the so-called Jebel Ithlib, northeast of the site. And so these inscriptions will hopefully be systematically studied by my Saudi colleague Maher El Musa. No proper settlement, Islamic settlement, was identified yet. And it is most probable that the main settlement in the El Ula region, of which Medain Saleh is part, it's the governorate of El Ula, in the Umayyad period, was El Mabiyat, which is ancient Qurah, 40 kilometers south of Medan Saleh. As you know, Petra was the capital of the Nabataean kingdom, which was involved in the long distance trade of incense and aromatics, which were brought by land from the place where they were produced, ancient Dofar and Yemen, to the insatiable markets in Egypt, the Levant, and the Mediterranean. The Nabataeans were originally a desert people and were of Arab origin. We heard this this morning in the Kuwait University, at Kuwait University, as shown by their personal names and by the use of Arabic words in the legal formulas which appear in their private contracts written on papyri. So I played a small game, and uh, thanks to the databases of, person, of Nabataean personal names which I have on my computer, and I took from this uh, database the most widely attested Nabataean names, which is the colon on the left here, and found in Ibn al Kalbi's, uh, Hisham Ibn al Kalbi's genealogical works, their equivalent in Arabic. So, for instance, you have Aushu, Aushu, Aus, Aft, well, Asadu. Asad, Asad, Wa'il, Wahbala, Zayd, Ziyad, etc. And you see that most of them, except two, which is Aftah and Haidu, at least do not have an equivalent in Hisham al Kalbi's work. They may have an equivalent into other works. I'm working on this. The other thing I would like to draw your attention on is that Nabataean, like Arabic, is a consonantal 
uh, script, and so the vowels are not written. So when we have a name like Amr, and the wow at the end is just a phonetic feature which is proper to Nabatean. So all names, almost all names, end up with a wow. There's no way one can know whether Amr is Amr, Amr, Omar, Ammar, or Hamar. It's impossible to know. Except that we know from uh, Ibn al-Kalbi's work and uh, Jamharat al-Nasab published by uh, Kaskill that it occurs 538 times under the form Amr. So maybe it's more likely that it's Amr. The other slide I wanted to show in relation with the Nabataean speech Arabs is precisely this question of the legal papyri. And it's very interesting to from this quote, to see that a sequence of legal terms which are in Aramaic, so it's the blue ones, okay? They are followed, they have a semicolon here, they are followed by their equivalent in Arabic. So you have here uh, the equivalent in Arabic, hudud, qism, thabit, and the word as it appears in the papyri, and their equivalent in Aramaic. So it means that those who wrote these contracts, they were possibly addressing people who were Arabic speakers. And this is a much better and stronger argument in favor of the Nabataeans speaking Arabic than the fact that they bear Arabic names. And the third one, which I have not talked about but because that's another subject, um, is the question of the liturgical um, texts, which we have from the so-called Ain Abdat inscription. So the Nabataeans lived with their flocks between desert and oasis and knew where the best wells and routes were. This allowed them, from the 3rd century BC onwards, to control progressively the trans-Arabian trade. This was made possible by the use of the dromedary, which had been domesticated since the early 1st millennium BC. Of course, control implies monopoly on the transport of the goods and on levying taxes. So thanks to the wealth they accumulated, which was often envied by their neighbors who attacked them more than once, the Nabataeans gradually became sedentaries and built cities of which Petra was the most impressive. In its greatest extension, the Nabataean kingdom extended from Damascus to the north in Syria to the Hejaz and from the Negev to the west into the Syro-Arabian desert in the east. Hegra was therefore at the southern end of the kingdom, it appears clearly on the map, not far from a frontier, which was going to become later that of the Roman Empire. Indeed, from the beginning of the second century CE onwards, in AD 106 CE precisely, the Romans overtook the kingdom and created in the limits of its territory the Roman province of Arabia. There is no doubt that Hegra and the Hejaz were part of the Roman Empire, and the southernmost Roman military camp where legionaries were stationed is being excavated there since 2015 by a talented Polish archaeologist and a friend of mine, Zbigniew Fiema. And this is, again, a small parenthesis. Um, I visited, uh, well, a couple of years ago, the Musée de l'Art Antique, and they have a wonderful map of the Roman Empire, which you would have thought would be correct. But in fact, it's not. And I think that most of the maps of the Roman Empire we found in the uh, school manuals are wrong. The Hejaz is not in the Roman Empire. So in a way, I think I, I know that scholarly works takes time to become taken by the um, civilian society, and I hope it will come soon. But we, in a way, are able with our work to correct the maps of the Roman Empire. I mean, it's not given to anyone, you will agree with me, that it's, uh, it's um, a nice thing to be able to correct the maps of the Roman Empire, something which one would assume is known for a long time. So many Greek and Latin inscriptions which shed light on the role and importance of the Roman presence in the des these desert margins were discovered recently, including two extremely beautiful painted Latin inscriptions which mention the Roman legion which was stationed in Hegra, the third legion Cyrenaica. So 
This is a view of the uh, Roman camp from uh, an aerial view, and you'll see that it's quite large. I think it's more than 80 meters uh, from the, this end to this end, and about 60. Uh, and it is, huh. I went there with my daughter a couple of years ago, and I told her, look, here you're in the Roman Empire. And I asked her to make two steps forward. And I said, OK, do these two steps forward, and you're not anymore in the Roman Empire. So it's a fascinating thing that you're in a place where you can jump over a wall and say, OK, I'm in or I'm out, and like the Hadrian Wall. So this is what happens here. So that's why I get a bit excited. The Nabataeans, however, did not arrive at Hagra at the end of the 4th century BC, which is the date when they first appear in the ancient sources in Petra, as we know from the 1st century BC Greek geographer Diodorus of Sicily. They arrive at Hagra, and we know this from the excavations, around the middle of the 1st century BC, led by a movement southward, possibly due to the development of the maritime route through the Red Sea and the existence of harbors on its Arabian shores north of Jeddah. As you can see, I have made the effort of putting all these uh, harbors, possible harbors, on the Arabian shores of the Red Sea, which not often see. Indeed, Jeddah marks roughly the northern limit of the monsoon winds. North of the 20th parallels, parallel, which is roughly this line, winds blow from the north throughout the year, whereas south of the 20th parallel, the direction of the winds change according to the season. And so you see it's in summer it goes from the north and in winter from the south. And so it is much easier to sail in this part in summer, but it is always difficult to sail in the northern Red Sea. And this is something we should keep in mind. So whether the main harbor, Luke Kome, and I, will, I realize that I haven't so I would like you to point to this, al Wajah and Ainuna, okay? And so whether the main harbor, which is known as Luke Kome, where a 25% tax on the transshipped goods was taken by a probably Nabataean centurion, was at the latitude of al Wajah here, or further north at that of Ainuna, is another issue in which I will not enter now because it's too detailed, and in a way it doesn't interfere with what I'm saying today. What is certain is that from the end of the first century BC, there was a caravan route from Hegra to Petra. Um, yes, Petra is here. There was a caravan route, which I have followed, actually. And most of the Nabatean inscriptions from this road, there are 800, they have just been published in a book which has been published in Riyadh, I mean, 2018, a month ago. So I hope copies will circulate soon. 800, took me quite a while to edit them. And so along this road, both men and camels are known to have circulated. So since the surveys and excavations began in 2002, the results obtained by the uh, project team members are extremely numerous and can be quickly summarized as follows. So the project was thus able to evidence a funerary tradition of the late Bronze Age proper to Northwest Arabia, also attested in Taima. Taima is 200 kilometers north of uh, Hegra. To determine the existence of a 52 hectares ancient city, strongly urbanized and surrounded by a rampart built in the first century AD determine the layout and chronology of the rampart, and excavate fully one of the main gates which gave access to the ancient city. Bring to light, in the area of the Jebel Islib, several banqueting installations which were used during the Nabataean period by the members of the Nabataean fraternal societies and were abandoned in the early second century AD soon after the Roman annexation. And I could tell you why. If, so this is just a telling you questions you have to ask me afterwards. So why did, the Rome, why did they stop using them? Discover the southernmost, as I said, Roman fort, fort of the Roman Empire about 
500 kilometers south of the fort of Hamema in Jordan, with which it shares strong parallels. Record hundreds of inscriptions written in Imperial Aramaic, Nabataean, Nabateo Arabic, Greek, Dadanitic, and other varieties and vari varieties of Talmudic. Discover in the area of the Roman fort and the so-called Southeast Gate between 2014 and 2017 of an important group of Greek and Latin inscriptions, which allow to reassess thoroughly the role and investment of Rome in these marginal areas of the Roman Empire after AD 106. Excavate six Nabataean monumental tombs, which have yielded a large quantity of human bones, leather, textiles, and vegetal remains. These have allowed, for the first time, to reproduce a Nabataean funerary ritual, from the death of the individual to his burial in the tomb. Finally, closing this non-exhaustive list, to excavate what is probably the largest Nabataean sanctuary at the site, which was possibly devoted to the cult of a god who is not known elsewhere in the Nabataean realm and who bears the same Elah Shamaya, which can be translated as the god of the sky or the god of heaven. And I could also spend a long time uh, on this because it's the, these are very interesting topics. So it is, of course, not possible, either in this short paper or um, yes, during a 45-minute lecture, to present all the results obtained by the team in 16 years, especially since the fieldwork is combined with a huge effort to study the artifacts brought to light, which include pottery, almost 1,000 coins, glass, metal, bone, and wooden objects, animal bones, vegetal remains, etc. So, well, as a small tribute to the team, the Medad Saleh team, which is a very, very nice and friendly team, I just show two photographs of uh, people working. So uh, these, and, and I'm grateful to Hubert Raguet, the photographer, who made these very nice photographs. So these are excavation photos, either in the tombs or in the ancient city. And the ancient city is made of mud brick, which is complicated to excavate, very hard, very tough. And some of you know this here because mud brick is a difficult material. And this photo, which shows uh, the people working in other, uh, in studying the objects, or like me, uh, studying the inscriptions. And I wonder how I never broke my leg in Medan Sarif because I keep climbing everywhere and sometimes in tricky places. So um, I'm very grateful to the team members because it is their work uh, which I'm presenting today. So since the recently given lecture at the Dar al athar al-Islamiyya by my Jordanian colleague and friend Ziyad al-Salamin was devoted to rock-cut architecture in Petra, most of which concerns the world-famous Nabataean tombs, I have decided today to focus the rest of my uh, talk on what happened outside and inside the tombs before and during the Nabataean funerary rituals. The reason for this is as follows. So thanks to the clearing or excavation of six Nabataean tombs since 2008, one of which was previously unlooted because it was buried under a sand dune and was totally invisible before its clearance. It is possible for the first time to explain how the ceremonies were performed, who was buried in the tombs, what kind of treatment the deceased received, this being also enlightened by the contents of the Nabataean inscriptions and by the fact that some mention the name of those who were buried and of at least one person involved in the preparation of the deceased before burial. So uh, we'll, you see this sand dune, and of course, when we removed it, uh, the tomb appeared. And so it's, it reminds me of something which I really need to say to the, uh, those colleagues who are around and to you, uh, who may be not archaeologists, is that we always find, find what we're looking for. And it is not by chance that we were able to find this one. Uh, it's because we were looking for something special. And that we had the idea that maybe between these two tombs, there was another one. And you know the site has been there for ages, been known since the 19th century. But we found it. So it's good. 
because we only find what we're looking for. And this is important to remember. So allow me first uh, to show you a short video of the excavations of one of the Medan Saleh tombs. And uh, it's actually not an excavation proper, it's a clearance, because it's a tomb which had been um, robbed and visited for a long time, but there was a lot of material still inside. And at some point, we thought that maybe it's not good that tourists just walk on the bones and uh, see the leather and etc. So we decided to clear it. And it happened that with the TV team. So I, just for you, I had the comments, which are in French because it's a French documentary, uh, translated into English. So the subtitles are in English. It's been done on purpose. And the beginning is in Petra. The first two images are in Petra, but then we move to a tomb, and the tomb is, oh, is Hegra. Uh, sorry, this is before, the, before the, the video. I'm sure you're expecting it, waiting for it. Uh, this is a, the, just an, an Abatine inscription. They've been known for a long time, since Josena Savignac and the corpus of Inscriptionum Semiticarum, of an Abatine inscription, which is a legal text, uh, which was put on the um, inscribed on the facade of the tomb. And so if you see the translation, you see that it says, this is the tomb which Kamkam, -Kam, daughter of Wailat, daughter of Haramu, and Kuleibat, her daughter, made for themselves and their descendants. So they were all women. And Nabataean tombs sometimes, not often, but sometimes belong to women. And it is clear that she made the tomb for her daughter and uh, and the Kulebet, her daughter, so daughter and granddaughter, for themselves and their descendants. And so descendants includes both male and female. So it is quite a nice example, especially since this inscription is dated exactly to zero. <laughs> zero does not exist, so it's minus one plus one. So it's a nice thing that it is exactly at the turn of the era, because it's dated to the ninth year of Eretas. And of course, you know, the rest of the legal text is uh, known, I will not... Uh, go back to it in detail. So I have to press this, and it lasts for four minutes. I will stay quiet. Quelle place occupaient donc ces sépultures dans la société nabatéenne pour qu'on leur consacre autant d'énergie et de moyens. Au point que toute l'architecture de cette civilisation semble s'être développée à partir d'eux. Les fouilles de tombes menées à Egra ont permis d'apporter quelques éléments de réponse. Nathalie de l'Hôpital est une spécialiste de l'archéologie funéraire. Mais ici, comme à Petra, les 2000 ans qui se sont écoulés ont laissé bien peu d'indices pour les archéologues. Elles ont été complètement pillées. Et c'est des pillages qui ont eu lieu, euh, qui ont été répétés et répétés. Ici, je trouve vraiment rarement des choses en connexion. C'est même un piège avec une certaine violence, parce que les choses sont déchirées. Euh, dans, dans la tombe que j'ai fouillée précédemment, j'ai pu déduire qu'ils arrachaient les doigts pour récupérer des bacs, par exemple. Cependant, grâce aux conditions climatiques particulièrement sèches qui règnent ici, il y a souvent plus d'informations à glaner dans les restes de ces pillages qu'à Petra. Ici, on trouve euh, principalement euh, des ossements, donc d'individus qui ont été inhumés dans cette tombe, euh, du cuir, donc qui devait servir au linceul euh, pour les individus, du bois, pour les cercueils ainsi que du textile. La quantité de ces ossements montre que ces sépultures abritaient bien plus de corps que le nombre de fosses creusées à l'intérieur ne pourrait le laisser penser. Là, par exemple, vous avez deux fosses. Donc là, vous avez probablement un individu qui est enterré dans les fosses. Et ensuite, ils accumulaient des individus sur le sol, dans des cercueils et dans des linceuls. C'est des animations qui, ont, qui sont déroulées sur trois siècles. Les premières analyses du matériel récolté lui ont permis d'être plus précise. Ici, vous avez les ossements que j'ai découverts dans Tobohygène 97. Donc vous avez surtout les crânes, les mandibules. Et 
Et là, une partie des bras que j'ai découvert. Vous avez les enfants, donc je les ai classés ici par taille. Donc dans ce tombeau, ce qu'on peut déjà dire, c'est qu'il y a des enfants de tout âge qui sont représentés. Ensuite, ici, on va essayer de connaître le nombre d'individus qui ont pu être inhumés dans ce tombeau. Donc à partir, par exemple, là, des humérus, on a à peu près une vingtaine d'adultes. Une autre tombe des gras a livré les restes de plus de 80 personnes. Je vais également rechercher ce qu'on appelle les caractères discrets. Donc c'est des caractères qui vont nous permettre de déterminer si les individus qui sont inhumés dans la tombe sont des individus qui appartiennent à une même famille. Ces caractères morphologiques particuliers, liés au patrimoine génétique, permettent d'établir un lien de parenté entre les individus qui en sont porteurs. Là, j'ai un exemple avec les humérus. Vous pouvez observer ici une perforation que vous n'observez pas sur celui-là, mais qui est présent également sur cet individu. Donc à partir de ceci, je vais pouvoir dire que ce sont des individus qui appartiennent à une même famille. Les tombes à façade nabatéenne sont donc des sépultures collectives qui regroupaient enfants et adultes d'une même famille. Et elles étaient utilisées durant de nombreuses générations. Okay, so one of the um, tombs excavated, which is called IGN 117, which is the way they are numbered, located southeast of the ancient city, yielded very interesting results. It's not the one which Nathalie is, uh, was clearing. It is a small tomb, the only decoration of which is two rows of cross steps, like many tombs in Petra. The Nabataean inscriptions written above the door says that it belonged to a woman named Hinat, who had it carved in 6061 CE. The excavations showed that 80 individuals were buried inside the tomb between the 1st and the 3rd century CE, either directly on the rocky floor of the tomb or in the unique cyst tomb here, a simple pit carved inside the funerary chamber. The artifacts collected during the excavations include huge amounts of textile and leather fragments as well as vegetal remains. The latter turned out to belong to a necklace made of dates strung on date palm leaflets slightly twisted to link them to each other. Because of the vacuum, the vacuum around the desiccated fruit, it is probable that the dates were fresher when they were arranged around the neck of the deceased as a vegetal offering. The dead body, naked and wearing only jewelry, both metallic and vegetal, like the, de the date necklace I just mentioned, was coated with a blackish organic substance. The body was then wrapped into three successive layers of textile of decreasing fineness, one made of animal hair dyed in red, with vegetable dyes such as madder, rhubarb, and dock roots, and two of undyed linen, separated by layers of this same black substance. After the layers of textile, it was wrapped in a leather shroud closed with leather straps. In some cases, a leather mortuary veil was carefully placed over the face of the deceased. This veil itself was not coated with resins, which shows a desire to preserve this part of the body. The latter, which was probably thus prepared in the family house, was finally carried from the city to the tomb using a decorated leather transportation shroud equipped with handles and carried by four men. And so I will sh just show a few slides uh, explaining how the specialists who have worked with us, including uh, Patricia Dalpra and Martin Le Guillou and Charlene Bouchot, the textile, leather and vegetal remains specialists, have worked from sometimes very tiny, you see this is 10 centimeters, pieces of agglomerated uh, textile and leather and uh, could, were able, through the examination of hundreds of them, to restitute the drawings which I have just shown. This is, for instance, uh, a leather shroud with, uh, you, so you can see exactly how it was uh, sewn, and it, they have been studied in detail by uh, Martin Le Guillou, who was able to so exactly say how, how long, how large, and how well soon the, the, the leather shrouds were done. 
This is also, for instance, a handle. And you have to imagine that there was a rope inside here, which was used, a uh, rope or leather um, strap used to carry the shroud around. And you see the decoration, the decoration, which is quite nice on the transportation shroud. Also, this is one of the veils that we found very recently, and they were actually examined uh, last February in Medayat Saleh. And so this was put without these uh, resins inside uh, on top of the body. So the analysis by gas chromatography of which of the blackish substance showed that it was composed of vegetable oil and resins, which contributed to a better preservation of the body. Contrary to the Egyptian mummies, however, the organs were not removed. And I like these drawings, which were made by a young illustrator, and he, he's done them about two weeks ago. And um, they were done for, uh, initially for the documentary movie. His name is Elio Trimbaud, showing, I mean, we work together, so it's, uh, it's not uh, only his fantasy, of the atmosphere, he tried to restore the atmosphere with which it was done. So for instance, the putting the veil on the head, and I like particularly this one, which shows the transportation of the dead body from the city, which is just evoked in the far and away, and uh, the procession coming up to the tomb in order to then ultimately put the body inside the tomb with torch, you have the torch here, lightning, and the people around with the body. And, and this is, looks very much like an Abatin funerary structure inside a tomb. So, an Abatin inscription di discovered at the site known as Um Jadaid, about 150 kilometers northwest of Medayan Saleh, was written by a man named Taim al Khawar, son of Kaufa, who said that he is a hanta an embalmer. And in both Arabic and Aramaic, the radical hanat means to make spicy, to embalm, to prepare for burial. See the Arabic hanat. It is possible, therefore, that the preparation of the body for the burial was undertaken in the house of the deceased by the hanat whose name uh, has uh, come to us. Uh, his name is Taim al-Khawar. I don't know if it's an Arabic name. Taim al-Khawar. I don't assume so. Other tombs excavated at Medan Saleh yielded large quantities of artifacts which confirm that the burial practices evidenced in IGN 117 are not a phenom an isolated phenomenon, but were common in other tombs as well. For example, this, sh this unlooted tomb, which I have shown you earlier, saying that we only find what we're looking for, um, this is during the excavation, so these are the loki, and you see how the door was closed. And actually, be below this, uh, this mound, you have all the pottery which was uh, kept and preserved in front. And uh, Nathalie de l'Hôpital, who's really not reasonable, and I had forbidden this to her, initially she had gone, she, she crawled in. And you never know what can be there, snakes or things even worse. So this uh, tomb was excavated in 2015. It contained all the original burials, 27 in total, arranged in two levels. The first in the wooden boxes, each of which contained eight individuals, including men, women, and children. Then, probably, when the wooden boxes were full, 11 individuals, again men, women, and children, were buried in the central part of the funerary chamber on two levels. The anthropological study, still preliminary, shows that the individuals belong to probably to the same family. It also shows that children under 20 were also buried inside the tomb. And more surprisingly, that this was also the case of perinatals. A perinatal is a baby who died between one month before birth and one month after birth. So the perinatals were also buried inside the tombs, which is usually not done uh, that way in antiquity. A series of DNA analysis of 40 bone samples, which belong to 40 different individuals found in the Medan Saleh tombs, is currently being performed at the Harvard, Medical, Harvard University Medical School by the American genetician David Reich, who is directing a project on the ancient DNA of Arabia. So the results are, however, not available yet. We just sent the bones about uh, uh, a month ago. 
So we learned from the excavations that the funerary chambers, this is sort of summary, that the funerary chambers of the tombs were used intensively, that there was no selection by gender or age, that some individuals at least were part of the same family, that there were only primary and not secondary burials in coffins, in wooden boxes, in cyst tombs cut in the rock or on the floor, that resins were used to delay the, comp the decomposition of the bodies, that the latter were wrapped in textile and leather shrouds and were sometimes provided with bronze, shell, and glass bead jewelry, and at least once with a necklace made of dates. We have also been able to demonstrate that special care, the, the special care brought by the Nabateans to the treatment of the deceased. This contradicts the statement given by the first century CE Greek geographer Strabo, according which the Nabateans treated the deceased like dung, the fumier, a misconception based on li a linguistic confusion between Aramaic kafra, kapra, tomb, and Greek kopros, dung. The material used, such as the textiles and the leather, were of a high technical quality, and some leather panels used for the shrouds were, for instance, carefully repaired. It is thus clear that the aspect and wrapping of the mummy were important for the deceased's relative and loved ones. Honoring the dead was also important among the Nabateans. Remembrance ceremonies were organized. Small commemorative monuments, the nefesh, were raised. Funerary assemblies met in large rooms where banquets were performed and offerings were put in pottery vessels in front of the tomb's door, as evidenced by the tomb we have excavated. So these results are totally new, especially since the archaeological results are supplemented by the analysis of the Nabatean inscriptions, the anthropological studies, the chemical analysis, etc., in a res resolutely interdisciplinary approach which makes archaeology such a fascinating science. This is even more true when, as easily noticed through the names of the colleagues I mentioned in this lecture, it is performed on the basis of an international and friendly collaboration between scholars coming from various backgrounds and countries. Thank you very much.